What's up guys? I hope you're all doing well. Today I'm bringing you back yet another Q&A video. So if you have any questions of your own, post them down below and let's begin. Hey Alex, at what point in a person's lifting career do you think recomposition is no longer an option as a natural? Technically it never stops, but there does come a point where the option is far less feasible. What I mean is, if you look at the EXRX chart as a general guideline and look at the elite numbers, that's when recomposition becomes tricky. Because at this point, gaining muscle is already an extremely slow process and strength plateaus are bound to occur even if you're in a calorie surplus while following the best of programs. So what happens when the odds are stacked against you and you decide to throw in a calorie deficit into the mix? That's not easy. You can pull it off, but it's gonna take way more time than if you started a lean bulk, which if you analyze it logically, makes far more sense at this level. Remember, it doesn't have to be dirty bulk, it doesn't have to be gaining a tremendous amount of fat. One pound of fat per month will result in four pounds of fat every four months. That's nothing, guys. You can cut that off in less than a month easy with a mini cut. So wouldn't it make more sense to do a four month small bulk where you're optimizing every factor, followed by a three week mini cut if needed, because maybe you won't even have to go that far in the first place. You'll feel more recovered every workout and you'll never get fat, that's the thing. So when we talk about the option of recomping, it's not that it is impossible. You see me do this in 2016, where I maintained a weight of 180 pounds while improving all my numbers. So I got bigger and leaner. After a certain point, I noticed I wasn't getting the same results with that method. So I switched it up, went down different paths, so dirty bulking, standard bulking. And my ultimate conclusion is that a small calorie surplus is truthfully the way to go for the vast majority of you who want to get to the highest level possible. While not having to stress so much about the diet aspect because it's already hard enough to make sure that everything is on point programming wise. Now you're gonna add in that extra little boulder in front of you that you gotta move, man, that, at least in my opinion, once you hit the elite status. If you're below elite, you can probably do it to a certain extent, but even then, like, I say the moment you're starting to experience a lot of stalls in a maintenance phase, it's in your best interest to increase the calories. Yeah, you can make gains in a, in a small uh, deficit, make sure your protein is high enough. I'm not denying that it's a valid option, just that it's not the best option. And I think a lot of you already know that intuitively and from experience. But yeah, but yeah technically the recomping never stops. I can do it right now. Just that it's gonna be so much slower than the other options that I discussed. Hey Alex, thanks for answering my question. It's a pleasure, brother. Let me answer this one too. Here's another one. What do you think about weighted RTO ring dips? Have you ever tried it as one of the dip variations? Would you recommend it? I've never gone that far because I honestly find RTO ring dips to be difficult enough. I don't know if it's because of my hypermobility, because you see me do 230 pounds on the weighted dip, but RTO is just brutally difficult. I find it to be one of the most hardcore dipping variations of all time. I don't know why that is for me, but it's hard. So I wouldn't even dare to put on weights. Maybe if I did 25 pounds maximum, it's just when you turn your hands out completely. That external rotation, the upper back swells up like crazy and the leverages are modified to a significant extent. I can't even describe the brutality of this variation. So I would just do higher repetitions, man. Staying in the 20 zone, making sure that my form is perfect. Not having my traps all the way shrugged up here. Straight arms, vertical body, you know, using proper form. I've heard some guys say, oh, well, this is easy. Yeah, I look at their videos and they're doing the form that I used to do back in the day when I had Experts come to my comment section and correct me. They were like, yo, Alex, I know that you're good at weight this, but this is a ring dip. You got to treat it differently. So if you're using the instructions that calisthenics specialists recommend, weighted is going to be brutally hard. But if you're able to handle it, honestly, I would go for it. If I was able, I would do it. Maybe it's a way of getting more or less weight. Technically, it is, right? So I don't have a problem with it if you're strong enough. But if you don't have the textbook form dialed in, don't even mess with it, it's too hard. Hey Alex, is a fine dude deadlifts once per week. I am a trail runner and my legs do not recover for two times a week leg workouts. Love your content. Thank you, brother. Well, I'm not familiar with the whole trail running programming. It's not really what I do, but I do have experience with running every day. I did it for six months in 2019 and I didn't lose any muscle gains. Of course, there was a period where my waist started dropping considerably. I was actually in a massive deficit and that resulted in some temporary strength loss, but it came back up the moment I managed my calories correctly. So it wasn't the cardio itself, it was the deficit that was affecting everything. And it was 
too much and I probably wasn't getting enough protein to compensate for that as well. So besides the little side thing, two times a week leg workouts should not be hurting your recovery in my opinion. If it is, maybe you're not managing volume intensity the correct way or you've been using the same variation exclusively. See, I don't do regular deadlifts twice a week. If I choose to pull from the ground, it'll be one time. The second workout will be off blocks or better yet, scrapping that completely switching it to a good morning, which is more of a hip hinge than a conventional deadlift. In fact, I'd like to recommend that as an option for you. Since you have all these recovery stresses to deal with, why not pick the good morning where, I mean, you're obviously not deadlifting 500 pounds, you probably won't need more than 95 pounds. I would say between empty bar and 85, given what you're doing as an athlete, should be more than enough weight. So with the deadlift, you might be hitting, I don't know, 315, no idea what your strength is at. Whereas with a good morning, equating it that way is less than 100 pounds easy. So that would be much better from a recovery standpoint. And in this way, you can actually get the proper hip hinge in twice a week instead of your once a week deadlifts and you feel fried. Or like I said, you do one workout off blocks, one workout off the floor. But generally speaking, if I'm being honest with you, for your goals and needs, deadlifts once a week would in fact be fine. But I'm saying that if you want to get even better results, I would up it to twice a week, just changing up the variables very slightly or just doing the good mornings because that will make you feel rejuvenated. When and why you have periods of, for example, three week waves and other periods of regular three sets of six to 10, because I can. See, I'm not following linear periodization where my volume intensity is being manipulated in such a specific way that if I don't follow it, my gains are gonna go downhill. I have so much freedom, it's unbelievable. That's the power of concurrent periodization or the conjugate system in general. All I'm doing is keeping my volume intensity high. I rotate exercises to address my weaknesses and minimize overuse while overriding the law of accommodation and everything's fine. What I decide to do beyond that point, it's up to me. If I want to include a three week speed wave, if I feel like it, okay. It would be similar to doing a three sets of 10 for three weeks in a row and then swapping out that variation. I just do it to mix things up. It makes it fun. It gives me a bit of a challenge. I don't have to do it. Technically, I can keep all of my sets and reps exactly the same for the entire year, literally. You know when you look up those bodybuilding programs and they give you a workout? Well, I can do that workout the way it's listed, but as long as I'm rotating the exercises, that volume and intensity can be maintained yearly. That's what I'm saying. The waves don't matter as much. I just like to incorporate them because I do feel that it helps to manage fatigue. It's good for psychological reasons as well. It gives me some goals to shoot for and I don't see any downsides to incorporating waves and a lot of strength coaches prescribe this, either in the form of speed training or other methods that I've talked about. I just like three week waves. And if you want more info on this topic, watch my full video that I did on the subject. You'll get a lot more details there. Are one arm pull-ups worth pursuing from a relative and absolute strength, muscle development, and overall athleticism standpoint? Or do they bring no additional benefits in these regards relative to other pulling exercises? Thank you, Alex. I definitely think they're overrated. Coming from a guy who's done five in a row, and I think it was 20 or 25 pounds weighted for one or max. I think you're getting most of the benefits from standard weighted pull-ups. And they're actually better for programming because in this way, there's far less fatigue buildup and you can do your classic three sets of 10. You basically have more control over the percentages. One arm pull-ups, for a lot of you guys, that's gonna be a one rep max or you're forced to do negatives. So how are you gonna program that efficiently unless you're doing high sets, low reps, like 10 sets of one. But even then you gotta do both sides and one side might be weaker and there's potential injury risks that go with it as well. It's a lot more stressful on the shoulders in my experience and elbows. Actually, um, I developed a muscular imbalance from doing too many of those on my left arm, which is partially my fault, but I mean, they're great. For me, it's like going above three plates on the way to pull up without even having to. So. If you're limited on equipment or you just want to challenge yourself with bodyweight training alone, it will get the job done and it smashes the biceps and the lats will get huge from it, way to stretch overload. Like you're getting everything. And from an athletic standpoint, it's obviously super beneficial in that regard. Muscle gains can't go wrong, relative absolute strength. But the thing is, it's not that the one arm pull up itself is what's giving you those results. It's that you got to it. What I'm saying is the journey to the one arm pull up matters more than training the one arm pull up. So I would say if you can do at least one, you probably hit all these things that you're talking about. So that's why I don't see it as anything special. Like sure, they're impressive. I love them. I'm going to keep doing them, but most of you would be just fine with standard weighted pull-ups. And that's the honest truth. 
Hey Alex, I'm on your novice program and seeing a lot of results. Glad to hear that. That being said, I recently tuned into your winning interview and wanted insight into if your program has minimized mileage and maximized longevity similar to his conjugate training style. How do your intermediate programs look in contrast? Cheers. I don't incorporate dynamic effort method as part of the yearly training cycle, but besides that, like volume day, intensity day, you rotate exercises. I was very much inspired by Matt winning, Louis Simmons, like, I'm team conjugate all the way, bro. If you watch enough of my videos, you know that I fully support the system. I really do believe it's the best way to train for maximizing every factor of one's physique, the strength, the size, the longevity. It's number one in my books. And I think that minimalist programs are a one-way ticket to Snap City. Like you're getting high mileage with that and you're gonna get snapped up at a much earlier age. So it's not that it's ineffective, just that guys who do that long-term always get banged up in the end. And we've seen this time and time again. So conjugate, is the solution out of that. And I also believe that you'll get more jack doing it and better carry over to most sports. It's more of an athletic based system. And the fact that we keep our volume really high year round, it's a great way to gain size. And generally speaking, stereotypically, I found that conjugate guys are bigger than minimalists. On average, if I just look at a comparison, right? And this is excluding the gear. So your question is, how do my intermediate programs look in contrast? Like, I'm not a power lifter, that's the thing. So I use those principles in a general context. For example, naturally enhanced is pretty much this with an emphasis on yoke training. The neck, traps, upper back, shoulders, forearms, and glutes. Whereas Matt Wenning is directing his focus to the big three and other athletes. I think he, he works with fighters, tactical divisions. So what we're talking about here is a system. What changes is the exercise selection relative to your goals and the manipulation of certain sets and rests, but that part doesn't differ as much. For example, you see me max on weighted pull-ups, yet I rotate the variations every time I do so. Same thing on the dips. Same thing for any exercise that I choose to specialize in. You see me do a lot of rack pulls back in the day, guess what? Didn't repeat the same variation every single workout. One of them might have been a Jefferson rack pull after that, a hack rack pull, then the standard, then the snatch grip, alternating the pin heights. It's all about rotating variations and using the percentages that are specific to your sport. So if you want more of a bodybuilding emphasis, you might say in the 65 to 75% range. Uh, if you're just focused on general strength, you're gonna include all that, but also have some higher percentages as well in the 85 zone, you know? Just that my setup is different. You'll see that clearly if you look at his programs compared to mine, how many movements you're doing, the sequence, like everybody has their own take on the system. But mine is like, very general. So overall, a lot of us train very similar, just the template for the training days might differ a bit and the exercises and the overall goals. So as long as you're watching the videos, you're paying attention, you honestly should be okay. Hey Alex, what are your views and experience, if any, with arginine and citrulline? Arginine I've never tried because I've heard it's less effective, but citrulline I do have some experience with and I found that it gives me crazy freaking pumps. Like my veins are exploding every time I take it in, which is pretty Awesome. I think that's the best time to take your posing shots. When you're lean, take a bunch of citrulline, man, get a high volume workout in, you look absolutely fantastic, especially with some nice downlighting on you. But in terms of performance benefits, I can't say I've noticed any. I, I think it's purely a visual thing in the sense that you look in the mirror and wow, everything is just popping. I can't say it was beneficial beyond superficial reasons, unless we're talking about things that are not gym related. And I would also apply that to beetroot powder, by the way. So in this case, you have to time it more in advance. I think it's two to two and a half hours before. Citrulline is 30 minutes before. So it's cool. I got some on deck. It's always good to have, but it's not something that I consistently use and I don't notice much of a difference when I take it versus not. Hey Alex, on my OHP, I usually fail close to lockout, yet on my flat bench, I fail right off the chest. I can't tell whether I have a weakness in my chest or my triceps and shoulders. Please help share some Montreal. Okay, I have the same problem with the OHP. So I know that you have a tricep weakness right off the bat. And the chest element, if you're feeling right there, then you have a chest weakness, simple as that. So that's what needs addressing. Shoulders, I mean, technically everything, you could be weak on all three, but I would say it's more likely that it's chest and triceps limiting you. Because with the overhead press, you have no problem getting it off the bottom. So a bottom weakness on the OHP is caused by weaker shoulders, which you don't have. So you have a lockout problem on OHP, bottom on the chest. To me, the solution is very simple. You need more chest and tricep work. And the way that I would personally correct this is by maxing out on the dead bench, doing a lot more pause bench, 
and then hammer in your extensions like there's no tomorrow. And for the OHP, I got the perfect lift for you, OHP with chains. And also incorporate the Swiss bar since because the leverages, it's a lot harder to lock out. So I think with those little corrections, you should be good. Only using belt squats and weighted hyperextensions for lower body. Can't say I'm a fan for two reasons. One, I don't like minimalism. So you're neglecting accessories, which are crucial for your longevity and maximizing your leg gains. And secondly, the hyperextension is in no way comparable to other exercises like the conventional deadlift, good morning, Romanian deadlift, etc. So if we want to talk about a combination, I'd much rather you do belt squats and good mornings. And if you want, I made a full video on the subject, so you can check that out. It's what I'm personally doing, by the way. I find it to be optimal on every possible level. Easier on the recovery given the low axial load and getting more or less weight given the leverages and nature of the exercises and maximum volume can be incorporated. So it really is a bang for your buck combo. And then you could hit more accessories on the side like step ups, lunges, reverse hypers, a complete program. If you want to talk about a really good leg workout, you do belt squats, good mornings, lunges, reverse hypers, band leg curls, and then some abs. And technically, I can throw in two other exercises in there too. <laughs> but that's just a good baseline to start off from. So weighted hypers are good, but I would actually throw that in at the end of the workout. I would treat it as a lower back exercise, even though it does hit the glutes and hamstrings. To me, it's more fluffy compared to the bigger movements. Hey, Alex, would pull-ups, four sets of failure, and bent over rows, four sets of eight, twice a week be enough for back? Or what else should I do? Okay, that's uh, 16 sets of back per week. That's more than enough volume, but in terms of the variations, I wouldn't use the same style. One workout could be pull-up, the other one chin-up. And for bent over rows, alternate between pen lay and the classic style. Or supinated and overhand if you want to keep it simple. Or snatch grip and regular. Also, you can change the reps. It doesn't have to be four sets of eight every single session. One could be a bit higher, three sets of 20. The other one could be lower volume, whatever you want to do. This way you can prolong the training cycle for much longer with less plateaus. And also for those pull-ups, make sure that you do them weighted. Because just doing four sets of failure every time, I mean, it works, but I think you'll get better results if you treat it more as a standard progressive overload strategy. Alex, SSB, good mornings with chains. Good variation or too risky? I think it's pretty good. And I'm going to start doing this myself. The risk of the good morning is mostly at the bottom, if you ask me, not necessarily the lockout. And the chains will deload you a bit in that crucial position. It's why if you are doing deadlifts in general, the chain stuff is easier on your lower back. It's why block pulls are easier on your lower back because of the, the leverages that you're going through, you're not going in that deep position with the extra strainage. The chains, it the bottom very slightly, and then as you go through the range of motion, it's heavier. So to me, this is arguably better for good mornings. So I'm gonna start doing this myself. And yeah, I wouldn't stress about it personally. I would also do with bands, by the way. Hey Alex, are rows or pull-ups better for assisting the weighted dip? Usually we pair pull-ups and dips together, right? But that has to do with culture not necessarily what is optimal. I would say that rows probably go better because weighted dips are extremely stressful on the shoulders. So even though from a movement pattern perspective or just calisthenics, generally speaking, pull up and dip is the way to go. For longevity, I would say rows and dips are better. Alex, I saw a video. It's very hard to bench 315 for lifters who are under 180 pounds. I'm also one of them. Who says you're also one of them? Can I improve my bench without gaining more weight? I'm 75, 76 kilos, 15 to 17% body fat. If you still weighed that, yet had a body fat percentage of 10 to 12, you'd likely have your 315 and beyond bench. This is achievable. You can do it within your lifetime. I don't know who the fuck said that you can't bench 315 while being under 180, but it's complete And whoever said this, bro, 315 is being hit all the time by people who don't even have the best genetics. It's hit the point where if you do a 315 bench one or max video, people aren't gonna be that impressed by it. Like four or five is arguably the new 15 at this point. You got bodybuilders who don't even specialize in strength training that can hit this number. A lot of them are natural, by the way. It's just not as impressive as we once thought. And to do it one, under 180, you're talking to a guy who did it. Now you could say that, oh, it has to do with my arm length and my genetics and all that. Okay, we can pull that card. But still, I did this number years ago. And I've seen this happen time and time again. How many guys on this platform do we have to see hitting 15 before it becomes a common number? It's not the pinnacle of natural performance, guys. It really isn't. I would say 350 is gonna be a lot more challenging than 315. So I think you could do it. You just gotta train for long enough. You mean to tell me that 
if a guy who's under 180 trains for 10 years, he's not going to be close to 15 or directly at or even above? How about you run the conjugate system? How about you run a system that is so good that you have no choice but to bench three plates? I think guys are so impatient and incompetent with their understanding of optimal programming that they think that this is a hard number to hit. There are people with massive wingspans that can pull this off. And a lot of them aren't that heavy either. Some of them actually weigh 181, which is not under 180, but it's close enough, right? So yeah, it can be done. Happens all the time. Just look it up on YouTube. And these people are not outliers. A lot of them have shit looking physiques, if I'm being honest with you. So they have an even higher potential if they actually dedicate themselves to it. Hey Alex, would you consider using straps on your weighted pull-ups in the future in order to lift more weight? I'm just asking because I'm curious. I've never seen anyone do it. I've never really trained that way. So if I got a PR, would it be because I gained strength or just had the straps allow me to push my limitations? Basically, I had the performance the whole time. Like technically, could I do 185 pounds on the way to chin up today if I put on the straps? I don't know. Imagine I could, that would blow my mind. But the thing is, I've seen so many guys hit amazing numbers without them that I would just feel like doing it. I don't know if it's a bias. I don't know if it's me not being logical here, but I mean, look at Austin Dunham. He hit my goal weight already on the way to pull up. He did it without straps. Look at these guys in the calisthenics competition who hit four plates on the pull ups. None of them use straps. Actually, I've seen some guys do a mixed grip of all things for Wonder Maxis. Maybe I'll try that too. So it just doesn't sit well with me knowing that most people aren't doing this. It's not like the deadlift or dumbbell row or barbell row where you actually have to after a certain point. This is a freaking pull up. So I don't know, man, maybe I'll try it out. I will say that I did it once on the one arm pull up and it was significantly easier. So I don't know how that would translate with the two arms. All I can say is that I don't have any grip issues anymore. And I don't know how much it would help if grip isn't my limiting factor to begin with. It might, it might not. I mean, I am curious, but at the same time, like, should I really go down that path? Who knows? Maybe I'll try just because you recommended it. Can you weigh a lot while being lean as a natural? Depends what you mean by weighing a lot. If you compare yourself to a steroid abuser, <laughs> you're kind of a lightweight in that regard. I would say most people who get close to the genetic limit are going to weigh between 160 and 200 pounds. That's for factoring in average height. Lean, okay? And I'm saying lean, lean. Not being fluffy and calling yourself lean. If you're on the taller side, you'll probably be between 180 and 220. I don't know. I'm not a tall man. I can't really say. And if I base it off what I've seen online, again, most people tend to be under 200 pounds when they're actually lean. So do I see you being 250 pounds lean? No. Do I see you being 240? Probably not. I think I would cap it at 230. And that's if you're really, really tall. Most people are not going to hit that level, which is fine. You don't need to weigh a lot to look amazing. My best physique is when I weigh 165 pounds. That's nothing. But I look heavier because of my height. And that's what you got to factor in. Your height matters the most in this discussion. But honestly, I wouldn't sweat about it. Look at your muscle measurements. Look in the mirror. Doesn't matter if you're 180 or 200. If you look good, you look good. Hey, Alex, what do you think about replacing barbell rows with Yates rows and upper lower split? I find barbell rows to be taxing on posterior chain and interferes with my next day's lower body workout. You got your answer then, brother. The Yates row, I prescribed it for that exact reason. More upright body angle, can lift a bit heavier as well. But the main thing is reducing lower back stress, which you kind of figured out on your own. So I don't have a problem with it, but I do think that barbell rows are generally better in terms of getting more out of less weight. Also yields better carryover to standard deadlifts and you go through a deeper range of motion. So I do prefer them. And these days I don't really do a lot of Yates rows, but I can understand that if your lower back is all achy and you want to optimize your recovery for that, then it's better to do a Yates row than not, right? And in your case too, you can also combine the Yates row with the cable row. This way you make up for it in that regard. It doesn't have to be limiting yourself to one movement, you know? So the way that you're doing it, it's probably going to be okay. My stomach is not fat, but blocky. What can I do to look more aesthetic? You just got to keep losing weight, man. You're probably a lot fatter than you realize. Most guys who claim 10% or 15% body fat, those who claim 15, around 20. It just has to do with misrepresenting what your leanness actually is. Beyond that, you can get your back as jacked as possible, your side delts. Become so muscular that you don't even notice your waist. So hit your genetic limit size-wise, get stupid lean, and that's all you can do, really. 
Besides that, it's the way you flex in your pictures, the lighting, all that good stuff. But some of us genetically have wider waist than others. And that's something we have to accept, not get mad about it, but just own it and do your best to work with what you got. Alex, this is purely hypothetical, not a serious question for you, but if you dedicate yourself solely to powerlifting, what total do you think you could achieve at a 160 body weight? Thing is, I'll never know because I have no plans on maximizing my powerlifting potential. It's just not something I particularly care for at this current time frame. So I can speculate all I want, but if I'm not doing it, what's the point of having the discussion? I can assume certain things that I believe are possible. And to that, I would say four or five bench, 100% realistic, 500 squat, no problem. I think I can probably do a 650, 700 deadlift. So the main thing that I don't really know what my potential is would be the squat, since I've been so lazy for many years. But do I think I can total 1700 pounds? Yes, I do. Some people might call me delusional for that, but look at my bench and performance. Look how comparable it is to some powerlifters, man. I'm hitting some really good numbers at a pretty low body weight, and I can absolutely be competitive for the bench only stuff. Deadlift, I just stopped at a certain point. I would say after I did my first cut, I just got lazy on it, and I never got to the highest level of which I was capable of. By now, I would have been well in the 600s, that I know for a fact, because I was already closing in on certain numbers. You know, I saw, you saw me do a 655 hack from the ground, 700 high handle trap bar deadlift, 565 easy sumo. Like, I never stopped progressing on the poles. I just limited myself. So I know that for bench and deadlift, man, I have so much more inside of me. And maybe the deadlift, I'm gonna go back to doing because that's something I actually do care about to a certain extent, just not right now. So the squat, that's where I don't know. But what I could say is that it used to be my best lift. As crazy as that sounds. When I was a novice lifter, the two lifts that progressed the fastest was my bench press and squat. Deadlift was by far the weakest. It's the lift that I had the most trouble gaining strength on because I do have shorter arms and my leverages are actually not the best for it. So I had serious squatting potential and I have super short femurs. I'm actually quite built for it. So I don't know what I can pull off, but I'm sure I could do something in the mid 500s. Could I do 600? I never pushed myself hard enough to know. Alex, random question, do you speak French? Oui, je parle français parce que j'habite à Montréal, Québec et c'est la langue primaire ici. Donc si vous avez des questions en français, tu peux me demander et je vais t'aider, mais probablement en anglais, parce que c'est difficile de dire les termes comme concurrent, périodisation. So I don't even know if I said that right, but in terms of my understanding of French, fluent, I can fully process it, no problem. And I can speak it perfectly as well, just that some words I stumble on, like I gotta double think, you know, which makes sense. But if you have any questions, like, Ask me, bro. So you have it. We're done this q and I thought the questions were really good. Let's see some more down below, and I will talk to you all in the next Q&A.